So he's considered one of the co-founders of the internet, and that's a pretty cool title. If we discover everybody has fallen asleep. Yeah, that's generally if they're nodding off, yes, then you know you're done. He moved to uh, Google, where he became, and this is the second coolest title he has, Internet Evangelist. I mean, what a job. Any, you could do anything with that. The uh, actual title at Google is Chief Internet Evangelist. <laughs> <laughs> Without any further ado, I do want to welcome Vint Cerf. You remember what Einstein said? Things should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. If you design IoT devices and you have a, an overly simple model of how they should work, uh, you will create uh, chaos. There are some people who think, okay, there's a user, there's an app on the mobile, there's the internet, and there's the device, done. And that's all just fine for one device. What if there are two, three, four, five, six, seven, a hundred devices? Uh, suddenly, you don't want to be flipping through 80 different apps to figure out how to flush the toilet. So we have to think about this as an ecosystem. No, there's a very interesting uh, problem here. If I walk into someone else's house uh, and I'm carrying some devices that are already part of my ecosystem, are, should they be detectable by my friend's home? Uh, should my friend's home automatically try to incorporate my device into their ecosystem? Should it figure out that it's foreign and shouldn't be connected at all? But I really like this, this notion of I'll call it a sort of pseudo-awareness and uh, an ability to recollect, uh, mm. to detect that somehow we are experiencing something which is unexpected and unpredicted. Imagine that you are configured to know about some set of devices and they are identifiable when they're in your, in your vicinity, and a device which is not on that list shows up. And so then the question will be, how do I assess what to do, should I? propose to configure it into the system? Should I reject and ignore it? Should I warn somebody or something that's monitoring my uh, system that uh, a device has shown up unexpectedly and I don't know what to do about it? But this idea of detecting the unusual, I think is a very important concept that not too many people have incorporated into their design. But I want you to imagine that you have 100 devices in your house. The last thing in the world you want to do is to spend uh, the afternoon, or for all I know, a week typing IPv6 addresses into some application program to get all of your devices configured. What if you have multiple lights? Let's see how many lights there are in this auditorium. Uh, and I only, if I only wanted to turn on one or two of them, how do I refer to the lights that I want to turn off and on? I mean, do I have to give them names like George and Eddie and Frank? And, and then how do I teach the guests, you know, that this is Frank over here and this is Eddie over there? You guys got a list. I think there's also a big issue here, a more general one, and that's this question of um, understanding what machine learning can and can't do. What's very important is not to mistake this specialized machine learning from general artificial intelligence, which is what our human brains do. We're not the same as those machine learning tools. We formulate models of the real world based on small amounts of experience, and we use the models to interact with the real world. We, in, we reason about the model. We take actions based on the model. And I want to uh, maybe overemphasize this for you because I'm now fully convinced that most of our interactions with the real world are not based on our immediate sensory input as much as they are based on the models that we have. So Jan LeCun absolutely believes yes. the reason to have a visceral reaction mm -hmm. to something is to warn you or load the model with weights that say danger, danger, or must go in that direction. Fascinating. Which Fascinating. is, I think, a really interesting yes. thought. And then David Eagleman says, indeed, uh, when you look at how the brain reacts to a physical situation image, only 20% is coming from the sensory input, your eyes. 80% is playing back a model just in, in neurological activity. Not only are you taking uh, the, the sensory input in uh, and you're, you're predicting what it is that you should be seeing. And so yes. there's this stack of predictions yes. 
And that's what you're matching against the input sensory system. And as long as the sensor sensory information matches you, the you're prediction, in model mode only. you don't pay any attention, exactly. you know, sort of on uh, subroutine mode to drive the work. <laughs> but right. as soon as something doesn't match the prediction, then you start working your way up the chain until finally it becomes um, uh, conscious. How many times have you driven home and you don't know how you got there? Uh, or, or worse, uh, you're supposed to go someplace and you, <laughs> you end go up going place. someplace else. <laughs> But the final thing I want to say about AI and machine learning is that I'm not worried and scared about robots are taking over or AI is taking over the world. I'm concerned about software that has been given autonomy to make decisions without my intervention. I think that people who write software have gotten away with murder for the last 80 years or so because they say, well, it's just a bug. But when we're relying on these devices to do things for us, just a bug may be more than just a bug. And I loved your idea that uh, we've never solved for bug-free software. That's right? correct. And so if we haven't solved for it in benign systems that are just linking web services and social media, So what, what do we do about the more uh, less, less benign, benign systems? systems. Yeah. Yeah, so your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I, I think that part of the, let us say, response to this problem is to design these systems so that they have some ability to sense when they have gone beyond their normal bounds, when they have gone, we, we need red lines, so to speak, and if they are detectable, a parameter has gone out of scope, for example, uh, then you could make a kind of generic uh, assertion, the device will not get into a state that goes outside of this parametric space. And that might... And then it has to have a shutdown mode or, or some other it, sort of rescue it, mode. It has to yeah. be that. It, ha it has to be able to sense that it is exceeding its operating parameters. But the, uh, the ability to specify and to sense this, I think, could be quite a powerful um, design uh, paradigm I agree. for the IoT devices. Once everybody adopted TCP IP, we were assured with high probability that devices that plugged into the internet could talk to each other across the net because they had observed the same standards. The same argument can be made for IoT as well. So all of these notions of standardization, far from stifling creativity, actually enable it because by creating interoperability, you now create a new platform atop of which many new applications can be designed and built. Whether we like it or not, there's going to be billions of these devices out there. Uh, if you consider a smartphone to be one of them, then there already are billions of those devices already in our hands. I think that one of two things is going to happen. Either we're going to have this utopian, wonderful thing where all these devices just work for us and they work the way they're supposed to and life will be lovely, or it's just going to be some kind of nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, and I frankly think we'll experience both ends of that spectrum. Uh, as these devices get out into use. Uh, Marcus, I have to tell you that this is one of the more invigorating days that I've spent in the last several weeks. Uh, and it surprised me in a way because, you know, Bell Labs has had spectacular successes, Nobel Prizes and everything mm -hmm. else. It's also been through a very complicated uh, restructuring. Parentage. Uh, 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 and again and again, <laughs> and particularly Bell Labs, yeah. which has gone through many different owners. And yet what I saw today was a kind of audacious... Um, willingness to explore uncertainty, to try ideas out, to, to uh, think, you know, in longer terms. And giving people the freedom to fail is exactly what you need for people to challenge the status quo. And so it feels like this place is infused with this new energy and willingness to try things out. It's lovely to hear you say that. I, I think that's true. Um, and I think it's actually we've been very lucky to have a set of parents who believed in that 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 was the right way to look at the world, to challenge the status quo for the good of humanity. And also, of course, hopefully there's a commercial outcome. There was never, even in AT&T days, which people think of the quintessential Bell Labs, mm -hmm. it was always a commercial outcome. It was a monopolistic commercial outcome, so it was easy. Yes. And you can almost say there wasn't one because it was so obvious. <laughs> but in fact, there was a commercial outcome, and, and the same is true now. But I think the sponsorship of great parents is foundational to being able to explore things that could possibly fail and could fail multiple times before ever finding the right answer. And I think that's so uh, we've been very lucky, actually, in that regard. Well, Vint, lovely chatting with you. Thanks very much.